Conan, I'm a teacher here. Um, we got a couple special guests tonight. Uh, Tola Leiter, who's a tremendous producer, whose films include uh, the Oscar-winning Glory with Denzel Washington, uh, Evita with Madonna and Antonio Banderas, um, uh, several other award-winning films. Uh, accompanying her tonight is Eric Darbalov, who uh, is a, another award-winning producer who's had films they do at Sundance in Toronto and Telluride, and whose company, Roadside Attractions, uh, has produced over 130 films, including the film we just saw just now. So please welcome uh, both of these special guests. Quite the movie. Um, I wanted to ask you, how did you get? How did the company, your company, get the movie? How did you get the movie? Um, well, we um, started a relationship um, last year, a year and a half ago. Well, oh, gosh, two years ago now. Time flies. Time flies. With um, <laughs> Amazon, because um, Amazon Studios was building up they're a, a distribution company and um, Bob Burney and Ted Hope um, started showing up at film festivals and it was very exciting because we've known them for a long time and discussions began and we released a film for them uh, last, uh, not this last December, but a year before that Spike Lee's film, Chirac. So that was our first outing with Amazon Studios. Um, just a little bit of back context for Roadside Attractions. We are a small company um, focused on theatrical releasing. So we're kind of like a specialty boutique theatrical company. Um, we don't do VOD releases or direct-to-video. Um, and we have a relatively small slate versus some of our competitors. Um, uh, you know, let's just say an IFC or even Sony Picture Classics, typically 20, 30, 40 films a year, um, sometimes That's more. Much, really? We're more like 10 to 12 movies a year. And it's very, from the get-go, the company was always designed to be open to partnerships. We kind of designed that company, the company that way. Um, part of it was out of need because we don't have the resources. We're not owned by a billionaire, we're not part of a huge multinational. So from a capital structure, we have certain limitations. It me we can still buy our own movies. We've done some great ones over the years where we actually acquire them on our own. Uh, Winter's Bone would be a good example of that. But thrown into the mix, we've always been excited about, I mean, it's sort of the classic Hollywood thing about other people's money. Um, but there's a My good favorite. side of that because you can, um, you can try really cool things. You can buy a level of media. You can think bigger. And that's always been part of our DNA. So when we started the conversations with Amazon Studios, it was very much in that context. I mean, we're sort of open for business. The, starting a uh, distribution label, and that's not to say that Amazon won't, but just in general, it is, um, it's a workflow that isn't, um, that has its challenges because you gotta keep, it's a pipeline that you gotta keep filled. Okay. Because if you have a bunch of people, you've hired all these, these right. bodies <laughs> and they have three movies a year to release and they're kind of sitting around twiddling their thumbs. It's sort of like if you go to a restaurant and it's empty, you right. can almost predict that the service isn't gonna be very good. <laughs> um, it's similar with distribution in the sense that you just kind of keep your, your, your juices flowing. And yeah. um, so, so we were very clear that we were interested in working with Amazon and, and Chirac was the first movie that we decided would be a good fit for us. Um, and um, that went out with um, sort of non-traditional windows and um, that that's a whole discussion going on right now with the exhibition community. Uh, sh you know, Netflix would be on one extreme. Should a, they want everything to go out day and date. Like you can stream it and maybe it'll be in a few theaters, but it all happens at once. The consumer rules, that's sort of one 
idea of how films should go out into the world. The other uh, perspective, if you will, is that film is a unique experience and it's about curation. So a movie like A Winter's Bone or A Manchester by the Sea almost doesn't exist without the sort of gauntlet of press and critics and the theatrical film experience kind of paving the way for all the other ancillaries. And I, I'm not necessarily saying one or the other is right. I think there's interesting aspects to both of those models. Um, but we are very much in the camp in terms of our business of traditional film releasing. So we did this one project with Amazon, Chirac, and it went pretty well, but we were very compromised in the number of theaters we could take because of the, the collapsed windows. And we had started discussions about a second film with Amazon um, called Love and Friendship, um, which is a Whit Stillman film. Whit Stillman is a, is a New York independent filmmaker who very much uh, inspired my generation um, with his early films like Metropolitan and Barcelona. Yeah. Um, not as well known now as they probably should be, but just great films. And he made this wonderful um, comedy um, called Love and Friendship with Kate Beckinsale, which um, Kate Beckinsale had been in one of his earlier films called The Last Days of Disco. So it was sort of a reunion. We saw the film and absolutely loved it. And we did one of our few uh, roadside attractions, PowerPoint presentations, and marched over to Amazon and said, this is a film that, that deserves a traditional theatrical release. This is what we do. We know how to release this film. Let's, let's really um, put some effort behind this and, and make it real. And um, I think it, it was good timing in the sense that it, I think they were starting to see some of the same thing, that maybe fighting the, the windowing argument didn't make sense for them at this time. Can you explain to the student maybe about the window? Thing? Windows is just really sort of the Netflix model where everything happens at once versus uh, theatrical going out first and then uh, you have um, a window. You know, traditional, a window would be like um, VOD would be a window. Um, SVOD would be sort of like a Netflix or an Amazon Prime. That's another window. In traditional windowing, all of these things are sort of nested and there's a negotiation about what happens when and there's um, sometimes things like early, what they call EST, which is a download right, which is different from a VOD right, which is more <laughs> like a, you know, almost like a rental model, an electronic rental model. So. It, there's a sort of legalese behind all of this, and it's sort of a no negotiation. It's about a certain time that laps between the theatrical release when all those other windows open up. Absolutely. Although the truth is, windows, it's funny, people will dismiss windows until, like, for example, a film festival will be very dismissive of the idea of windows, but then tell... Uh, you know, South by Southwest, that they're going to play after Sundance. And all of a sudden, it occurs to them that there are windows in all aspects of this business. There are windows. It's, windows is really just another way, way for who gets it first, right. if you want to think about it that way. So, so for Love and Friendship, we did a traditional release, and it went extremely well. Um, it grossed uh, almost $15 million at the box office, which for a Jane Austen film... Yes. It was uh, incredibly well-reviewed. It was 99% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. I think there was one naysayer that um, <laughs> we don't like, but that's that okay. One guy. One guy. And, um, and so it was a great experience, and I think it really paved the way for this idea of let's do something bigger. And actually, at our premiere of... Um, of we did a premiere at Sundance of Love and Friendship, and we brought the talent in, and we got in a van, and we all went to um, Manchester by the Sea together after the event, after the Love and Friendship event, and it just became clear that that was a movie that we all really wanted to do. So it was an incredible um, kind of meeting of the minds, but then it became, who, who, are they going to put up the money to get this movie, and, and it was Amazon's negotiation, and it was the story 
was that it sold for $10 million at Sundance, which was a very big number yes. for a film like this. And um, that became part of the story of Manchester, like this, the movie that Amazon put all this, these funds into. And that became a little bit of a PR challenge for us. And so we decided to kind of go quiet and um, there, we didn't hear a lot from us between Sundance and then um, we stepped out again at Telluride. Right. And, and then um, Toronto and the New York Film Festival and AFI, I think I have AFI correct. Uh, we played all the fall festivals uh, leading into a November release um, with, um, with Manchester. And, and for a distributor, because we're mostly doing finished films acquisitions, um, the, the questions you have to ask are, you know, you've got 10 to 12 slots and thousands of movies out there. And so it becomes, part of our job is curation. What do you want to have? What are the movies that you're choo choosing? And can you afford to acquire those movies for your territory? And then uh, another question would be, when are you releasing that movie? Um, dating, as we call it, is a crucial part of distribution because you have to look at the competitive landscape. You have to look at things like there was an election going on. How are you interacting with that? What does that do to the price of media? Um, media would be the next thing. In general, you, you have a certain amount of what you call P&A, prints and advertising budget to spend. How are you allocating that? Are you buying newspaper? Are you buying television? Are you doing online initiatives? And every film has a different formula as to how to spend the money. Um, and then uh, the, the last thing would be, um, not really the last thing, but one of the last things, important pieces would be uh, publicity. So you have uh, a publicity strategy and that might include film festivals. Who are you bringing? What are all the film classes you're doing? How are you prioritizing? If you're doing a, an awards race, how are you uh, prioritizing that? You know, you always want to put out the message that you're, you're uh, going for all different awards, but you also don't want to sort of bury the lead. You know, going back to um, Winter's Bone, we had a, an amazing cast with, um, you know, John Hawks and Dale Dickey and um, this incredible writer director and Deborah Granick. But we saw we also had this mega star in the making, Jennifer Lawrence. So, how do you? How do you bring everybody into the spotlight without uh, drowning the person who you know is going to hog it, if you will? So it's a tricky balance, and publicity has to really make a lot of those decisions and put priorities in place. And once again, it's also about, you know, you've got actors that are working all over the globe, and you're bringing them in, and you're doing a press day, and frequently people um, will come to our press days, and you see video cords all over and we take over a whole floor of a hotel room and you know you think to yourself how could this possibly be worth the amount of money why don't you just throw them into the hotel lobby but <laughs> but the fact is you may only get those actors for that one day yeah and you only have that press for a certain amount of time so if you're waiting for a chair in the lobby to clear just similar to production that may not be the best use of your money. So you may want to figure out a, a, an environment where you can make the best use of that talent you possibly can in the time that you have available and um, get as much press in front of them. And so that might be, you might do a press conference for certain groups like bloggers, for example, and you may do one-on-ones for key um, uh, publications and and making those decisions is all part of the, your publicity strategy. Can I ask you one thing? First of all, on Winterbone, my understanding is everybody liked it at Sundance and nobody bought it. Yes, and you guys did. Yes. What? Well, how was you? What were you thinking? What did you see in it that was different than other people did not see that opportunity? Well, that one was really interesting because um, our then head of acquisitions, who no longer is working with us, sadly, he, he, he 
left the business, which is a drag, but he was after very- work, After working with you. After working with us for <laughs> nine years. Um, but he, you know, I always joke that he hunted that movie down like a fawn. He said to <laughs> us, look at this, you know, he took the catalog, look at this. We had actually seen uh, Deborah's first, one of her first movies, I think she made two before that. It was also called Down to the Bone. Um, and it was an extraordinary portrait of a, a sort of middle class woman who was suffering from drug addiction. And um, he said, this, this woman, Deborah Granick, is an extraordinary filmmaker and we should pay attention to this movie. So, you know, we go through the slate. Sundance would be a good example. Um, there are about usually about 126 movies at Sundance, and um, you have to prioritize. The only we we're the heads of the company. We have the checkbook, and so we will realistically get between 26 and 35 movies at Sundance. Definitely no more. 35 is if crazy. It's time. already crazy. So um, as the head of acquisitions, you have to decide, okay, where are you bringing everybody? And, um, you know, we also have a head of publicity who can see some movies. We usually have a movie there. So he might be at certain um, movies and not others. We have a head of marketing. And in this case, we all loved the movie and our head of marketing said, you know, this is not just a great drama. This is actually a thriller. And I know how to sell this movie. So um, we saw, the thing I think we saw that others didn't see is that, that Winter's Bone was an amazing thriller. And the, the Jennifer Lawrence thing uh, kind of was exciting, but very much secondary, that this was, this was a wonderful performance. In fact, you know, Jennifer, um, her, she had a whole PR team leading up to that. And the first time we saw her kind of glammed out we were all kind of, you know, a little disappointed. Right. Like, this isn't the girl that we signed on for. And then she did this piece in Esquire magazine. I think it's called, like, Women We Love. And she was posing in a bathing suit. And we were like, no, no. <laughs> but In fact, I want to tell you something. When I saw the movie, I thought that this was a woman that they just found that it wasn't even an actress. She was so natural. A local, yeah. When, and then also, there's, there's locals in that film, right. so it's mixing kind of right. professionals. She had done a I couple of she wasn't real professional actress. jobs, and so she was um, on on the, the rise, actually, but I think they had to really fight to um, make that film with her, and I think ultimately really compromise with the budget. So, so I think that's one of the, sometimes I wonder, like, does it feel like for finished film acquisition, acquisitions that you know, anybody could do it. And um, then I go back to, there is an art to this curation. Um, we actually did a movie, um, a documentary, uh, another film that came out of Sundance, which, which nobody else wanted to buy, called The September Issue, about um, Anna Winter, Anna Winter and, and Vogue magazine. And that was an incredibly helpful movie for me to see professionally, because there's these two amazing women of a, of a certain age who are incredibly vibrant. Um, and one of them is a creative. She is cre out there doing photo shoots. Her name's Grace Coddington and she wants to hire everybody and she loves everybody and it's fantastic. And the other one is a, is a curator. And she, she has to say yes, no, yes, no. And it's the power dynamics between creatives and curators are quite fascinating and the fact is we kind of need one another and um, it's not always uh, easy to reconcile right. the two sides yeah well, you mentioned uh, in winter's bone finding you know seeing a thriller where other people didn't see a thriller uh, with Manchester one of the things that's one of the things that struck me tonight in watching it is while it's this movie that is very much a study in how humans deal with grief mm -hmm. it's also got a lot of humor it really like does. Far yeah. more than I expected. To see it in an audience rather than with the, you know, on the tape that I saw. It's like they were laughing the whole time. I they know. They totally got it. I really had hoped, um, in fact, I, we pitched it, but it never happened that somebody would do, you know, a panel or a 
a clip reel on the humor of um, <laughs> the Laugh of, Riot new of comedy Manchester because there is the a lot of great humor. In fact, I don't know if any of you are John Oliver fans, but he had this thing last week where he put peng dancing Ze penguins. zebras, 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 right, zebras into uh, the background, and it changes everything. <laughs> but the fact is, there's a lot of humor in this, in movie, this movie, and yes. um, I think it it's so what funny. makes it. It gives it that sense of real life. Yeah. Um, is that something you guys saw though when you originally saw it? Is that something that, that like in the way that Winter's Bone you saw the thriller component? Well, it was Did interesting because I, I had, a, had read the script of Manchester hmm. and um, I did not see the humor in the script. Right. And, um, but when I saw the movie, absolutely I saw the humor. And um, I think we knew that we were going to rely heavily on the humor in the uh, materials to sort of balance things out. I think from a marketing standpoint, it's hard to know wh how the movie would play out without the humor, but I think um, Lucas's performance is especially about, you know, to me, I just think of renewal and obliviousness of youth, and he's going to go on with his life right. no matter what, and he's like a moving freight train, and Casey just has to decide whether he's gonna stand in his way or sort of climb on board on some level. And I think that is what gives the film, uh, it's not even levity, it's actually in a weird way, it's gravitas right. in the sense that life has a way of going on no matter what right. terrible things Even happen. with a sense of hope to some small degree at the absolutely. end. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, to our credit, I do think that we saw that um, from the get-go. Um, I think this was a very ambitious plan um, in general, and I, th I think Bob Bernie from Amazon really deserves credit for, for, for driving that through the sort of vision of Amazon Studios to go full bore into the award season um, in November when things are really, really heating up because you know a lot of people say, and you saw it this year, there are films that just sort of fall off a cliff um, around Thanksgiving. They're just not grossing enough to hold screens. The critics are not supporting them enough. Audiences don't uh, embrace them for whatever reason. So there, there are definitely, in this award season's um, game, there are sort of sacrificial lambs, unfortunately. And that is um, hard to watch because some of these are amazing films. But, you know, it's... It's really um, aggressive to do what we did, um, even versus, say, Moonlight opening a, a month earlier. There's a big difference between mo opening in October and opening um, in November. I mean, obviously, that worked out beautifully for that film, too. But um, so, so between the the spend so and saying, everything, this was aggressive. So, how much was Amazon's money behind the push? Amazon's money was very much behind this whole project. And, um, you know, it's a, it, was a, it was an aggressive spend in media, meaning television and online media, and they, also they support. They came on on at what point in the process? They came in from the get-go. Okay. Amazon. Okay. Um, from Sundance. At Sundance. Right. So, um, and, and the deal, that that $10 million deal was Amazon's deal. Mm. So, um, you know, we were collaborating from the get-go, but at the end of the day, they have to decide how to spend their resources, and they were very ambitious and very... Um, behind it. Behind this movie from the get-go, and we saw it through, and it, and it worked out. Um, but it's, it's a scary proposition. So you have to have real confidence in your film that it's gonna sort of hold up to that level of scrutiny. And, um, you know, you're, you're, you're going through the award season starting in Telluride, as you know, you go to Telluride and everybody sort of brings their right. game there. And um, that's just sort of phase one because there's a whole group of movies that are gonna start premiering toward the end. They may wait till New York. Yes. They may wait till December. Yes. And um, some filmmakers want to twiddle with their films for as long as they can. So, so you have to really kind of 
read the tea leaves as far as what's going to come your way and decide whether it's ultimately worth it. Because, you know, now, for example, there's there's nothing out there for the for the yeah. sophisticated older audience. And so if you release a film in the spring, for example, we had a film with Sally Field last year in March called Hello, My Name is Doris. Excellent. We made the exact same calculation. We said, you know, this is an amazing film with one of the most legendary actors in Hollywood, but we do not feel like this is going to compete in the award season. And we're going to kind of forgo that and we're going to really focus on box office success. And we're going to find a great date for this movie where we have a clear playing field. And that means that, you know, people who like to go to movies aren't besieged by 12 movies. Exhibitors aren't um, besieged by all the other distributors right. trying to get right. their best screens. You have just a wonderful um, playing. playing field. So Yeah, incredible. This space that... that your, your company has traditionally worked in. You know, you're, you're doing films like Manchester, you're doing films like Winter's Bone and, and Mud and Margin Call, that are these very well-written, well-directed, well-acted films that are also very subtle and nuanced. Mm -hmm. In today's media landscape where we're overwhelmed as an audience by superhero movies and cat videos on YouTube. Right. Like, are Although you have you heard about this cat movie that's doing so much business? <laughs> uh, I cats saw in it. Istanbul? I saw it. <laughs> How is it? Adorable. Oh, there you go. So, <laughs> but so are you? David Aiello's wife said they had the movie, and you know the cat movie did more better than them. You yeah. know she and David Aiello, Oscar winning. You know it's like, and she said, "What is this cat movie?" And I said, "I went to see it." <laughs> <laughs> so. So are, are, you, are you guys seeing, though, as, as all this other media distraction is there, is it, is it harder and harder to, are you seeing more and more challenges in finding a space for the kinds of films that you guys are doing? Um, in some ways, absolutely, because there's so much noise out there in the marketplace. And, um, you know, I think because of the rise of the sort of VOD movie, the consumer is sort of overwhelmed with the number of movies that get released every year every uh, right. week and so you have to sort of rise above that layer and then you want to hope that you actually have the level of reviews or the audience that's going to show up um, but I think there's something else that works in our favor which is um, with the rise of Rotten Tomatoes I mean it's really? sort of like wow. uh, there's no other way to put it it's really about Rotten Tomatoes <laughs> It's become this brand, and so now, whether you're in New York City or Kansas City, um, when you go to the movies, you say, well, what's the Rotten Tomato score <laughs> to get that data point? And if you have a movie that's in the 90s, like frequently, we're trying to find those movies, you actually can now do more business than we could earlier on. So the tomato meter is driving the independent film <laughs> the business The tomato now. meter, I think, has a big effect. Some movies get kind of overpraised and some yes. movies get dumped on, and we've, been, we've had both. And, um, <laughs> and I think for the movies that get the, the, the really high marks, you can do more box office now than you could even five years ago. So it is a really interesting, complicated time, and I... I really feel for people who want to sit at home and watch Netflix and not go to the movies anymore. I get where that idea comes from, but I also come back to the idea that I don't think that a Winter's Bone or a Manchester by the Sea exists without the gauntlet of theatrical releasing and sort of making it a movie that is worth going to as opposed to coming into your house. I, I think there are other movies that can can thrive in that, but the the kinds of movies that we like to release and look for, um, I question where they exist in that landscape. I think what one of the things that we um, really learned early on is this this idea, and we call it a willingness to entertain. And I think that um, especially in those days, in the in the sort of very what you call navel-gazing Sundance movie, 
who are the who are the filmmakers who really wanted to connect with an audience, whether it's through humor or fear or what have you. And I think you've seen that play out in sort of the rise of the kind of arty uh, um, genre movies. Um, I don't think that we've taken the company so far in that direction, but I think there's been a cultural shift where I think independent filmmakers are really interested in their audiences much more so than, than telling a personal story for its own sake. And I think we've been able to really benefit from that. That's good. I think we should open up to the student to ask questions. Hi. Um, Hi. My name is Carolina. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, I just have one question because you just said it. Um, you said movies like this ones are more theoretical and that for Netflix. And I'm curious why. Because in my mind, I will say that the movies that are... Because um, if it's a drama, then yeah, I can stay in my house and watch on my computer. If it's a superhero movie, then yes, I want to go to the theater because the sound and everything, the special effects, 3D, makes it want to go. It makes it more worth it. So what's it, the reasons that you think that this type of movie is that for... Maybe for us as an audience, we think that this movie I can definitely watch on Netflix and it sure. would be as fun and perfect as if I was in a theater. Yeah. But if I, you understand the question? Okay. I totally understand your question. I don't, I, that's just not my experience. So everybody has to have their own opinion about this. When I go to the movies, um, I like to, um, I like to have an experience that's an, share an emotional experience in a room. You know, I like to talk about the movie afterward. I like something with what I would say sort of meat on the bones. That to me is a theatrical film experience that I want to have. I don't personally, I mean, I like great sound. I like great um, imagery, but I don't necessarily think that um, that's the only reason to leave your house and go to the movies. Um, and so... Popcorn is the other reason. I, I'm, I'm totally um, willing to admit that there are two sides to this, and there may be a whole consumer group, and I know there's a whole consumer group that's in your camp, and there's another one that's in my camp. My camp is on the older side and maybe getting older. Um, <laughs> like me. Hope and so. so that's sort of the big question about the future of the movie business. Is that group regenerating? with younger people who find, you know, I don't want that experience anymore. Like I listened to, you know, punk rock and whatever, 81, and now I want something else as I get older. <laughs> um, you know, and, or is that just a group of people who grew up in a certain way and are used to a certain thing and are just gonna get older and older and older? I, I don't know. The, I mean, the fact is that the, the theatrical business is, um, is not shrinking, but it's not growing either. And that is definitely of concern to companies like ours and what is sort of the future. But I would say that um, as it stands now, theatrical films are where you know, the cultural conversation is happening. The press is talking about them. There's series that has probably even bigger cultural conversation, but in terms of movies right now in 2017, I would say there's still a shift toward theatrically released movies, whether it's Manchester or, or a Marvel film. Um, I think those are the ones that sort of get, kind of cut through the noise. But that could change very quickly. I mean, Netflix is green lighting something like 50 movies this year. They're making major initiatives into, um, into movies. We, we're actually, uh, we released a film called um, Dear White People that we acquired at Sundance, which is a wonderful, wonderful film. And that's actually gonna premiere as a Netflix series that we were part of bringing into Lionsgate. And so I'm not opposed, I'm not like a, a what do you call the, a Luddite. Like I'm not opposed to all these changes. It's just in our core business, we're very much uh, embedded with the theatrical releasing model. So I, I think it's my job to point out that not everybody agrees with you. I didn't say I don't go. I mean, I study film, so I want. I mean, I like the theatrical releases. I'm just saying, what 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 makes a movie more fit better on the theatrical than on the computer? Well, I think it's especially I think since it's, Amazon. I think right favorite. now, it's really about um, p 
publicity and the sort of cultural conversation and sort of breaking through the noise. I think it's, it's very, very tricky for one-off films to do that in the current landscape. Not to say that it can't happen, but I think that a lot of the cultural conversation around Netflix and television is in series as opposed to films. And so it goes back to that question of what is a, what is a film? And when you know, TV is, I mean, we see it in our business, um, is, is really a vacuum for young talent now in a way that certainly was not true when I was uh, starting out. I mean, it's amazing how many young writers, even people who've done shorts, are being just sort of vacuumed up into the Hollywood television system, and it's incredibly exciting. And when those kinds of resources go into television, you know, you could make the argument it just keeps getting better and better. So what is the role of film in the future? I think that's a, it's an open question. And I think you really, the only way to really see that is to talk to television creators who have found success in that world who still want to make films and ask them, you know, why? Why do you want to do that? <laughs> right, because film is still the prestige. Oscar is only for uh, films, you know. Yeah. But, but, I mean, that only yeah. goes so far. Yeah. You can only rest on your laurels so far. If, if all of the excitement is around television, at some point film will just sort of slowly die on so the So let me ask you a question that maybe touches upon the thing. So if you go to Sundance, you go to the festivals that have, you know, premiere films and whatnot for acquisition, what is the quality that you are looking for in those movies that wants you, you makes you want to bid on it? Well, I think it has to be something that... You said something that, about entertaining in addition I think, to I think that's, that's part of it, but I think it has to... You just have to feel like it's worth going to the movies to see. So, I mean, it's really... It's, it's not always 100% clear, and unlike other companies that are always interested in doing the same kind of movies. Um, Dear White People would be a great example. I mean, we're, we're interested in trying different things. We've, we've released, uh, you know, a Toby Keith movie called Beer for My Horses that was, <laughs> uh, was about the middle of the country. We've released uh, faith movies um, of all different varieties. We're interested in bringing audiences to movie theaters. Um, so it's the majority of our business is prestige movies at Sundance. And, um, you know, part of that is there's going to be a certain number of movies every year that kind of get anointed by the media and the press and viewers. Yeah. And you have to sort of pick which ones. But in terms of what, is, what are the qualities, I think it's about sort of breaking through the noise. And, and it's never 100% clear. I mean, a good example would be a film like The Skeleton Twins. Um, um, you know, um, Kristen Wiig and Bill Hader are they beloved. Yeah. Um, they've been in a lot of movies that haven't necessarily found theatrical success. And so what is the alchemy of this combination that makes it feel like it's going to really kind of break through and work theatrically? Same thing with Richard Gere. He had done a bunch of films that hadn't gone so well. In fact, three back to back. And then it came to arbitrage. And we said, okay, this is like a, a Richard Gere, the movie star role in a film that really supports that. Let's really go for it. Um, but it's, um, it is an, that is an art and not a science. And, and in that sense, the economics of this business are pretty fragile. Um, the, the incremental cost for Netflix, other than a production, is you know, they, they put it up on the service there isn't tons of marketing. No. We're having to do all of this. Th their marketing is in marketing the channel. We're marketing each unique thing on its own, and that has real um, potential, real downside. Hi, my name is Teresa, and I think that my question um, is interesting for all of us baby filmmakers, and it would be um, if there's any advice that could be given to young filmmakers that make a short, it gets accepted to festivals, perhaps winning awards, but how do we 
manage the transition to possibly a feature? Does it have to, like, should it be good content plus good selling? Or is it like better to, to wait and, and like see if the screening at the festivals attracts people from companies like yours? I mean, it's a very hard thing if you're talking as, a, especially as a director, to launch yourself in Hollywood. I mean, I feel like in some ways it's as difficult as becoming an actor, a successful actor. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a level of alchemy that is really, really challenging. And I think the great thing is now that there are multiple avenues for doing that and TV being the obvious way of sort of making a name for yourself. I, I mean, I think it certainly helps if you're a writer. I think that that generating material or somebody who likes to read and is good at developing material is really exciting as well. Um, you know, I can only tell you that um, in my experience, I've, I, there was a time when I was a producer, I used to go to Sundance and um, you know, watch all the shorts and sort of keep tabs on that world. In fact, one of the, the, the first people I met in Sundance um, were the Duplass brothers, and I was at the premiere of their very first short they had at Sundance, it was called This Is John, and I raced up to them afterward. I said, this is so funny, it was like a really small short, but I knew these guys were talented, um, and I mean, I didn't know it. I just sort of suspected it. And I'm sure they were like <laughs> one of like eight people I did that to that. Um, but we kept in touch over the years and they, they were very nice about staying in touch and telling me what they were doing, but not overdoing it. And um, when their first film, The Puffy Chair, premiered at Sundance, I was in the audience and, um, you know, I loved it. And we actually figured out a way to co-release that very early with Netflix, um, interestingly enough. And um, we've maintained, you know, uh, business relationship over the years. And um, they produced the Skeleton Twins. And, you know, it's been amazing to kind of watch these guys. And then the final thing of Jay becoming an actor now and transparent. It just goes to show you there are no boundaries. Um, and I hope that as creative people, you guys can see your way through that. Because for me, when I was starting out, it was very much like, are you interested in television? Are you interested in film? Are you interested right. in business? Are you interested in creative? It's like, <laughs> it was all of these, you know, yeah. these, these, these boxes. boxes that you had to put yourself in. I think that's much less true now. And I would really encourage you all to try everything and I think that's that's where sort of the the alchemy has its best shot of kind of working in your the odds will be forever in your favor if you if you try and do as much of that as you can I think the other thing when I was executive uh, you know is uh, if we like the short it's like if you go you have a short and even when you plan to show it in a festival, you better have your next project because this is the moment. Because then people say, I really love the short. What do, you, what do you have next? And then you say, here, this is what I want to do. Instead of being in the kind of gray area where they're thinking, what can I give that person? And so, You know what I mean? Yeah, I so agree. I agree with that. It doesn't always work out that way. Right. Because you never know. Like you may make a short with your friend at, at, in November and it's, right. uh, you're at Sundance in January and then you, you're just lo and behold. But I would agree. And, and unfortunately, that is just a theme um, that you cannot get away from. No matter what aspect of this business in the movie business, it's like, what are you doing next? What are you doing next? And... Um, it just, you always have to sort of keep reinventing yourself. And then that's sort of why it's exciting, um, especially our, I feel about our business. Every film, just from a business perspective, is like launching a little company. <laughs> and it has its own personalities. And we interact with the filmmakers always in different ways. And we try not to be cookie cutter with our releases. But in some ways, we're always forced to be unique because of the diverse uh, slate of personalities. I mean, one, one thing, for example, um, 
you know, if you do a feature film or even a short, think carefully about your still photography because that's a really good example of where my business meets your business. Um, you know, you can have, I can think of an amazing film that I absolutely loved at Sundance um, that I wanted to sort of rally my troops around. And I could unilaterally buy something, but it's not usually a very good idea if your, your, your head of publicity and marketing aren't excited about it. And they had the most god-awful still in the Sundance catalog. <laughs> it was dark, and I just thought, this is going to be like pulling teeth because these people on some level don't really understand what they have and they're not being careful with their decision making. Um, and so I think it behooves you all to learn a little bit about marketing and publicity to understand what are the things that we go through. And when you see, you know, photoshopped posters, well, that's because we don't have the photography that we <laughs> want to support anything else. And there may be contractual obligations that you signed on to, like, you know, if this star is in it, then this person has a likeness. And, you know, sometimes people willy-nilly give likeness um, parity to unknowns for no particular reason just to get a contract signed. And all of that starts to sort of come into play. Um, and when you deliver a film to a distributor, and this can happen even with shorts. I just saw, who was it? So Neon, a new uh, distribution company, Neon, that is doing, um, what is the film that they just released this last weekend? Uh, anyway, they played a short in front of it. So maybe there's a life, there's a, there's a new theatrical life happening for shorts, but um, the point is that you can't, you cannot say creative exists here, marketing and publicity exists here, when it comes to movies, because they're all interconnected. Even though we're companies, we still don't have necessarily the funds to fly everybody in to do a new photo shoot for each movie. So we're, we're kind of doing our best. But um, try and think about that process. And, and you know that goes to how to network and how to present yourself. And all of that stuff becomes really important. Thank you. Yeah. So basically, you can't just go with the short and you have to really strategize around it. The one thing I do want to I do want to emphasize, though, is that there is not one type of person that succeeds in this business. And I think it's really important um, as I look at the filmmakers we've worked with, I see um, not as much diversity as I would like to see, but an incredible amount of diversity. Um, nonetheless, and certainly in terms of the types of people we've worked with, they are definitely not all cut from the same cloth. I was very lucky in my career. Um, I worked, I, I produced a movie early on with um, the director, writer-director Nicole Holof Center, and um, she was completely different from, you know, Michael Bay, let's say, for example. Like, <laughs> there was no comparison between Nicole Hollis Center and Michael Bay. But she was so professional and so wonderful to work with. And Cruz respected her so much um, because she was just really good, just naturally good at what she did. And so... Um, and she was very successful. I don't think you have to put yourself in a certain personality box in order to succeed. Good evening. My name is Erica. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for such a rainbow of emotions. I thought the movie was genius. Um, and I still would like to tackle the comedy aspect of it. I thought it was such a beautiful way of probably exaggerating and taking us to that um, roller coaster of emotions. And I think it really complemented. And my question would be, was that very intentional, uh, intentional from the very jump? Um, or did that um, sort of escalate it uh, during the process of making the movie? You know, it's a, it's a really good question. I wish I could, um, I had a great answer for you. I think that's really comes down to uh, the performance, Casey's performance and, and Lucas's performance and, and Kenneth Lonergan, the writer director. I can just say from personal experience, as I said, I did not see that in the script. I think a lot of the humor is there, but I think the, the it's it's a it's a dry humor and yes. i think if you meet 
Kenneth Lonergan, he has a really wonderful, very dry affect. And I think I can only imagine that that type of humor comes from his unique sensibility and personality. And that I think it's, it's, it's probably not obvious to even people on the set as they're watching it that it's going to be funny. I think it probably plays out in the way it's edited, in the, um, the sort of nuance of the dialogue, and, um, and then in the actors that he chooses. I mean, I think Casey also um, has uh, an incredibly sort of dry wit about him. And, um, you know, I think the Lucas stuff wouldn't play as well if it weren't playing off of Casey. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I always love that. Um, I'm from Boston. So I mean, that might have been one of the reasons why I love this movie so well. But you know, he's, he's, he's in that apartment house and there's the, all those different people that he comes in contact with and they're all so funny. But one of the things is where he's talking about the apparatus, you know, the woman's like, <laughs> should she get a new apparatus? And like, just the word apparatus, that's just such a, you can only say apparatus as a Bostonian and have it have a, you know, particular meaning. It just, there's so much richness to the sort of microscopic choices of the humor. And um, I think it would be very tricky to figure that out unless you were hearing it directly from Kenneth Lonergan in terms of his vision for the movie. And I, I like to think that um, this film was produced by a first time producer with a new company named Kimberly Stewart um, who made an incredibly bold choice in taking on this film and um, financing it. And I like to think that she probably saw some of that and when she started talking to Kenny about the, what this was gonna be. And so sometimes a script, I mean, that's why um, it's really important, I think, um, for us as distributors to, to, to try to be humble in a way. I mean, I know that sounds really faux, but when you're getting a script from a major talent, a proven talent, you have to believe that there's some reason. If somebody's done something that you've loved in the past, you have to believe there's something more to it. And sometimes the script right. doesn't necessarily communicate it 100%. And it's, as an executive, it's always worth it to have a sit down with somebody who's done something that you think is really good. Right. And... Um, and not, not to be cynical. You can't approach this business cynically because it will come back to bite you all the time. <laughs> I, I mean, if you're too cynical about a film and it's happened to all of us, you know, it'll go on to do you know, 10 times what you could have gotten it for. <laughs> so um, that's why some of it is about um, being able to communicate, one of the skills that you guys have to learn is being able to communicate your vision. And ideally it's on the page, um, especially as you do this a little while, it may not always be. Maybe that's impossible with certain yeah. types of, of, of tones, and this might be a good example of that. I see, thank you. Well, sure. but even I remember when I read uh, the script for Home Alone, it wasn't nearly as funny as the product at the end. Oh, yeah. Just the actors, the director. Well, and I, I mean, we have this, as, as if you sit through enough movies, you'll have this experience. Um, I've sat, one of my favorite movies is Boogie Nights. I mean, nice. I absolutely love Boogie Nights. And when I first saw it, I saw it at the Toronto Film Festival. I was tired and I was like, what? What, <laughs> it's sort of, sort of like a Quentin Tarantino movie, but not, and it just had to sort of sit in my mind for a little while, and frankly, I had to see it again, and something grabbed hold of me yes. that, you know, it's become like the great film for me. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. My name is Aina. I'm a filmmaker graduated from here. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you target your audience? And if the audience is like small, how do you expand it when you release the film? Thank you. Well, 
Thanks. We have um, we have a really nice um, network, if you will, of um, partners. So we have uh, first and foremost we have um, um, we have filmmakers and actors. So we can bring some some actors are very good now on social media um, and and very much a part of of act of uh, promoting. <clears throat> the film, uh, the director of um, Dear White People, for example, was so good, we realized <coughs> we needed to hire him <laughs> on the campaign. So he did a whole series of videos for us to help promote the film. And he had done a Kickstarter campaign, and he had followers, and he was very savvy in social media. Not everybody is like that. Um, but that's sort of n step number one. <clears throat> who are the who are the filmmakers? And then we have the exhibition community. Every theater has its followers. So um, in virtually every major city in the country, we have our primo screen, and we're going after that screen because people are used to going there. If you go to the ArcLight Hollywood, you'll see one crowd. If you go to the Landmark, you'll see <laughs> one crowd, maybe a slightly older crowd. If you go to the Encino, uh, Lemley, you'll see an even older crowd, yes. and it just keeps generating and sort of you try and fit the film with the the people that like to go to that theater. So be, you'll be that specific, city by city, specific oh, theaters absolutely. within cities. Even wow. on a even on a film like Mud, where we went out on 350 <coughs> screens. I mean, you could say for us that's sort of our version of a wide release, but those are hand-picked screens. Every, you know, you're only talking about a few screens in every market. In fact, in, in uh, a Kansas City, you might have, or, or a Little Rock, you might have only one screen. But you go, you go after that screen. I just came back from CinemaCon, which is basically a convention of theater uh, bookers and owners, and everybody converges, and there's a lot of meets and greets and talking about stuff. There's, a, there's another similar... Um, uh, conference for uh, independence called Art House Convergence that happens around Sundance. So we're in constant dialogue with exhibition, uh, marketing partners, meaning we're buying media, what media is effective, what are effective um, online strategies for bringing audiences. Um, uh, buying newspaper is a traditional strategy, but one that's still effective. Um, making trailers and posters and placing them um, in front of other movies because you actually have a group that's actually going to the movies, seeing your, your uh, trailer. Some people like them, some people hate them. It's still the most effective way yeah. for it to actually put, um, as we call it, butts in seats for the movies is the, is the trailer, which is, it couldn't be more traditional, but it now obviously has a life online and a life in theaters. And all of that adds up to uh, marketing and publicity for the film. Uh, thank you. One more quick question. You mentioned the uh, tomato mark helped the movie a lot. But in the future, like in this year or next year, do you think anything had the potential influence in film like box office? Uh, it, do I think there's anything uh, new? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I think we're getting increasingly sophisticated about um, how we're marketing our films. And as it, there's an app now in China where basically you can buy a ticket to the film and that can actually, um, that information can go back all the way to the distributor of the film. We actually don't have that technology yet. I mean, I think we're working toward that. But the more... The closer we can get to the person actually buying tickets to our films, the more carefully we can target them. And I think traditional media is kind of under assault right now because of all these, this micro-targeting of media um, gets more and more sophisticated every year. And we put more and more resources into online advertising. And I think you're going to see... We've already seen it, I think, with a movie like uh, The Witch, A24 released with very little or no traditional 
TV advertising, almost all online, doing $30 million. That, I think we're going to see more of that. Okay. Thank you so, so much. That's interesting. So, for example, if I, let's say I do a search, I'm looking for cashmere sweater on the internet. Well, now for a month, I cannot open yeah, without, my without, brother without... I think yes. there you can, so, you can be tracked and we are able to utilize that as well. But I think that that's viewed so if as... I if I, somebody who bought a ticket to see Manchester, to see... So now they should have tracking of me as the kind of person who goes to this kind of movies. Yes. And Target sent me in the same way. They sent me that cash. But I think that, mm -hmm. that that is, you know, I think the legality of that's being questioned. And I think the next phase is how do we find the person who's going to want to buy a cashmere sweater, not the one who's already searching for it? Do you see, you see what I'm saying? We need to sort of get increasingly sophisticated about how we place media. And if you feel terrorized by Manchester by the Sea, um, that's probably not good long term. So my guess is that that wanes and something new that's more sophisticated comes up. And it all, you know, should be leading toward a transaction. And I think we have, we as a business have to get better and better about making that easy, making that social media friendly. I don't know if you guys have seen Adam tickets and, you know, which has a sort of social media component of it no. built right into it. Um, you mean like a Fandango, but it's called Adam? Adam, yeah. Really? And it has, it's, it has the Rotten Tomatoes meter right on the, the dial. And, um, you know, I think that is an example of, of moving toward this slightly more sophisticated model. And maybe we have to play around with subscription-based film going, too. Interesting. Maybe we should be thinking about paying a, a lump sum every month, and you can go to the movies as many times as you want. They do that in Europe much more than they do it here. Wow. So I think things will change, and I think it has to change to sort of keep up. But it's, um, you know, it's going to be really hard for this this whole theatrical uh, model to kind of die. I think it's going to, it's not going to be pretty if it happens. No. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you. My name is um, Dana A. Bailey. I'm a filmmaker at uh, NIFA. Um, just a quick question for like the independent filmmakers. Um, I know you mentioned like cr being on the creative side and um, the marketing side. Say for instance, like superhero films. Um, should we keep that in mind? Like say for instance, we're writing a superhero film and um, we just want to make a good story, but we also see a lot of superhero films being put out. Should we stop making that story or we, should we just continue doing what we're doing or should we think about what's I think you have to really follow your, your, your passion. Um, <coughs> you know, I think that in terms of writing, if you have the talent to write, um, for every director, there are 10 writers with jobs. I mean, it's just an <laughs> easier gig because studios have multiple rewrites and, you know, I think that if you're passionate about superheroes, you have to be, you know, you have to respect that and, and follow through on that. You just have to do it in a way that's realistic. I mean, if you're, if you're writing about a Marvel character, you know, obviously, you're not going to be able to make that movie unless you have their approval. So you're, you're creating a gatekeeper for yourself. If you're creating a new superhero, you know the economics of superhero movies. Um, oh, it was the film Colossal that, that uh, Neon released that had a short at the front of it. Um, you Anne know, Hathaway? Anne Hathaway movie? And, yeah, the Anne Hathaway movie. So, um, you know, if you are, um, if you're creating a new superhero um, and it's, it's, it's sort of a franchise level film, it's going to require a $150 million budget to compete. That's a very, very tall order. The nice thing about you know, traditional independent films is that they, you can, you know, they're sort of, people joke they're like people in rooms movies, <laughs> and you can just make them a lot cheaper. So that might make sense as a calling card. Um, you know, I think now what we're seeing, um, I don't know if any of you guys saw that really great um, 
what is the, his name is uh, New Zealand filmmaker Taika Watiti. Mm -hmm. He did that. Hunt for the Wilder People. Hunt for the Wilder People. Right. You know, $5 million movie from New Zealand, and he's now directing um, Thor. So, I mean, what's happening now is that the studios, because they have their machines so down with these franchise movies, they really are looking for the directors to sort of bring the soul and the performance. So I think it's created an opportunity for independent really indie movie filmmakers to step right into that studio model. And, um, you know, I don't think that's going to end. So it's just, I think it's a question about like being sort of savvy about the business. Unfortunately, I think you can't get away from like, you got to read the trades and kind of keep up with what's going on. And I know it's incredibly boring to 99.9% .9 of all people. <laughs> but it really behooves you to understand the industry as much as you can. Thank you. Cool. Sure. Well, I have to say I have learned a lot oh. from you. So I can imagine the students um, understand a little bit more about, because just as they're confused about how do I go from short to a film, I think there's a lot of mystery about what happens when your movie goes to Sundance and who buys it and how yeah. do you, you know, what's, what goes into releasing a movie like this? Yes. It makes you think a lot because you don't understand the conversion of the marketing and the, the press and, and the publicity and, you know, the, the when to release it and how to release it and fresh tomato and rotten yeah. tomatoes. And, <laughs> it's know. a lot. I mean, the one thing I will say, just a parting thought, is that you guys are in an amazing place to have such a peer group here and to take that really seriously and, right. and be kind to one another because you, unfortunately, you never know who's going to succeed in this business. <laughs> and, um, you know, take each other's work seriously and be willing to engage and talk about it. And, um, you know, you might be so lucky that you make a, a, a friendship here that will last a, a, your entire career or a lifetime. So um, just take it really, really seriously. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you.